Paul continues his discussion of spiritual gifts by placing them all within the context of the greatest gift of love. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a more perfect way. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels and do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecy, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, and every action of all our lives be always acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Um, yes, we just heard the famous love chapter. Does it feel like we had a wedding today? <laughs> when preparing for a wedding, I'm always tempted to discourage using this chapter. Love is patient and kind and all that. I'm tempted to discourage its use, not because it's inappropriate, but because I've heard it so often. In fact, it is perfect for a wedding, and, and more importantly, it's perfect for a marriage. I've often thought this is a better reading for the 10th anniversary of a wedding than it is for the wedding. By the 10th anniversary, the couple knows the challenges and the problems. By the 10th anniversary, the couple may need to be reminded that love is not irritable or resentful and does not insist on its own way. This chapter is perfect for a wedding or, for that matter, for renewal of wedding vows, but that's not why Paul wrote it. Paul's not thinking about a, a wedding when he writes this. He's, he's writing to the church in Corinth where apparently there was some serious infighting. Some people were or claiming to be greater than the other people around them. Some people are, are claiming to be in the right, which means other people are in the wrong. And when you, you hear about this, on the one hand, you might say the people in Corinth are behaving like people everywhere. And there certainly is some truth to that. But such behavior and interpersonal debates are, are particularly painful and destructive when they happen within a church community. Now really, this entire letter is about the struggles within the church community. In fact, when I'm looking at the 13th chapter, I like to begin studying all the way back in chapter 11, verse 18. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. Paul goes on to say that when the time comes to eat the Lord's Supper, some jump in and eat first. And remember, at this time, that would have been a complete meal. And Paul said, some even got drunk. See, part of the criticism Paul is offering is that some are humiliating others. The people with, with more are humiliating the people who have less. And Paul puts great stress on the equality of people. He finishes chapter 11 with a discussion of the Lord's Supper. In fact, some of the words you'll hear a little bit later there at the altar come out of this section of the letter. Two weeks ago, we heard this continue with the first half 
of chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, my brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. If you remember that, Paul talks about how everyone is gifted by God. Now I said, I believe when we're talking about gifts, that includes the special abilities given by the Holy Spirit, but also things like natural talents, experiences, training, resources, anything we have that we can place at the foot of God to be used to God's glory. Paul lists a, a variety of gifts and stresses they're all from the same spirit. And he later says there's a variety of, of services or actions, but for the same Lord. All he wrote are activated by the one in the same spirit. See how Paul is again stressing the equality of all, how everyone is needed to build up God's kingdom. Then in the second half of chapter 12, which we heard last week, Paul turns, turns slightly from the discussion of gifts and skills and etc. And he begins to talk about the activities, the specific actions those resources make possible. In one of his most famous paragraphs, Paul teaches, For just as the body is one and has many members, and the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we've all been baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. He continues, Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less of the body. Now, clearly what Paul is doing here is using the, the analogy of a human body to teach about the interactions within a body of human beings. He finishes the chapter talking about specific roles people might have. He says, first there are the apostles, those who are sent out, then prophets, those who can explain God's word, then teachers, deeds of power, gifts of healing, forms of assistance, which is sometimes translated generosity, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Going back to the body analogy, he asked if all can be any of those, can, can all be prophets or teachers? Obviously the answer is no, and he says, I will show you the more perfect way. Well, let's, let's just pause there for a moment and consider what has happened. Paul has led us through a description of what God has given us for ministry, gifts, skills, talents. We think about that, especially things like our experiences and training, and it's, it's not unusual for us to think about how much, how much we have accomplished. And it is important to take the beginnings God gives us and to, and to shape them and use them. A, a, a person with a great talent for mathematics will accomplish very little without some advanced training. And once they have that training, they should then take that and put it to God's use, to God's glory. Yes, it is important that we do our part, but it's also important we don't take too much credit for ourselves. There's a, a saying I like because it keeps me grounded. It says, yes, you pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. But who gave you the boots? And I think that's part of what Paul's trying to get across. So anyway, Paul described what God has given us for ministry, and then he describes some of the various ministries we might be called into. He talks about apostles and teachers, those who do deeds of power and those who heal. Now, as we read that, it's easy to read over the list and not find ourselves on it. See, Paul seems to be focusing on the dramatic, the miraculous, versus the everyday actions. Paul seems to focus on the work of saints rather than our ministries. It's, it's, it's easy to ignore this section as being irrelevant to us. But then comes what I consider the keystone for all three chapters. Paul has talked about all these, these great and wonderful ways and says in a verse that's frequently ignored because of its placement, 
Paul says, strive for the greater gifts and I will show you a more perfect way. It's a surprise. We, we've heard this discussion of powerful and miraculous ministries and Paul says there is something more, something more important. And with that, he launches into that 13th chapter, the, the love chapter we heard a few moments ago. What Paul says is, is, is how we treat each other, whether it's a couple or a larger group, how we treat each other is more important than deeds of power or miraculous healings or great words of wisdom. The quiet, sometimes barely noticed acts of caring are more important than the dramatic demonstrations of power. Paul tells us that the, the simple ministries any of us can do are more important than the actions that are only possible by a very few. The, the teacher is lecturing in the front of the hall and in the back someone is confused and, and the person sitting next to them helps find their place. Maybe not all of us can teach but all of us can help the stranger. And remember, when Paul talks about love, it's about how we treat other people and not how we feel toward other people. Paul says, I can be proud of my ability to, to speak to mortals or as an angel, but if I don't treat other people well, I am nothing but a noisy gong. Paul says I can be so, so highly educated and intelligent that I understand all knowledge. But if I do not treat other people well, I am nothing. Paul says I can be so generous that I give, give everything away. But if I don't treat other people well, I will gain nothing. Now, it's clear that what Paul meant when he said he would show us the more perfect way. The, the way of love. The way of treating other people will, will far surpass the importance of any other gift, skill, or training. As I think about this, I'm constantly reminded that when, when Jesus was asked what was the most important commandment, he said it was to love God and treat your neighbors well. Jesus said that every other commandment came from those two. And Paul is saying something similar. He says that Loving other people is preeminent. All other gifts take second place to love. What is particularly wonderful about that is it presents something anyone can do, any of us. Not all of us are, are great teachers or prophets or musicians. Not all of us have those talents and gifts, no matter how hard we work at it. But all of us can treat other people well. All of us can strive for the greater gift of giving love.